Well, brothers and sisters, we now come to have a closer look at 2 Samuel chapter 6 <coughs> and to see why it was that David operated as a Melchizedek king priest. And I think the answer has already been given in our first session, but we want to fill out the details of that and see what import that has for ourselves. So this is the purpose of this study on the tabernacle of David. And in this particular chapter here, 2 Samuel 6, we want to dig down into what's here and establish why David disrobed as king and acted as a Melchizedek king-priest. We want to ascertain the qualities of the Melchizedek order and its relevance to the tabernacle of David. And we are helped in that by this statement by Brother John Carter in his book on the Hebrews, where he says, Perhaps the most striking piece of typical history is found in the account of Melchizedek. That's how he considered it, to be the most striking piece of typical history in the Old Testament. Because there's a type there, isn't there? As he says, of Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, he says, These three verses will be classed by many as among the more difficult portions of Scripture. Yet careful examination discloses their meaning. And that, in turn, leads to a greater appreciation of the Word of God. And that's what we're about here over the course of this weekend. We go away, hopefully, with a greater appreciation of the Word of God, which we love and which we know is the Word of God. So let's have a look at Hebrews 7 very briefly. Just to follow on from Brother Carter's comments in relation to the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> so this is what we read. Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, which is the meaning of Melchizedek, and after that also king of Salem, which means peace, which is king of peace. So he has these two aspects to him. There's righteousness and peace. And we know, of course, that that's the scriptural formula. You can't have peace without righteousness. It's got to come first. So he's king of righteousness first, and then he's king of peace. That's how it works in our life. You don't get peace without righteousness. And, of course, our righteousness primarily is the forgiveness of sins, the imputed righteousness, but it also requires that we live righteously. So this is language inscrutable. Look at verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So he doesn't have father in the record. There's no record of his mother. There's no descent given of Melchizedek. We believe it was Shem. Brother Thomas believed it was Shem. But you see, the record's silent about that. It's silent for a reason. Because Melchizedek is being made like under the Son of God. He's being elevated to a higher level. And so this is inscrutable language to some. Brothers and sisters, I think you and I can see what it's all about. So consider the importance of Melchizedek in Paul's treatise in relation to the Hebrews who were wanting to return to the law. Come back to chapter 5, well, just over the page, isn't it? Chapter 5 of Hebrews. In verses 1 to 11, he's talking about this Melchizedek order. Come down to verse 6. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In verse 10, the apostle writes, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And at the end of chapter 6, Verse 20, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is a big part of what the Apostle is saying here in the, in the middle of his epistle. And all nine occurrences of this name Melchizedek in the New Testament are in the book of Hebrews. And there's only 11 through the rest, of, there's only 11 in the whole of the Bible. So it's being used by the Apostle to counter a return to the law by Hebrew believers. Hebrew believers. We met that word Hebrew back in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. And so what's the crux 
of Paul's case. And this is important to 2 Samuel chapter 6. What's the crux of his case? Well, it's this in verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews 7. If therefore, he says, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So his argument is pretty clear, isn't it? There's two priesthoods here. The, you've got the priesthood of Aaron and you've got the priesthood of Melchizedek. And then he says this in verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, let's just pause and consider what he's saying. He's saying that right through the Old Testament, in places like Psalm 110, verse 4, for example, where Yahweh swore to his son through David, I will make you a priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is clearly going to supersede the Aaronic priesthood. It's going to replace the priesthood of Aaron and his sons. So Paul's argument is, if you change the priesthood, then you change the law. Because the law of Moses required the sons of Aaron to be the priests. He didn't say anything about the Melchizedek order. But if you're going to change the priesthood, and Christ is now a priest after the order of Melchizedek, then you've got to change the law. And that, of course, is exactly what has happened. <clears throat> and the argument is developed from Psalm 110, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 1, verse 3 and 13, 4, 14. Chapters 5 and 7, as we've just taken a couple of verses. Chapter 10 of, the, of, of Hebrews, verses 11 to 13. That argument plays out through the whole of this epistle. So, brothers and sisters, the point I'm wanting to make is simple. When David operates... As a Melchizedek priest, as we've just read in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it's not about the law of Moses. If you change the priesthood, you change the law. That's what the Apostle tells us. And that's what happens back in 2 Samuel chapter 6, as we shall see. <clears throat> so what about this man, Melchizedek? As I said, his name means king of righteousness. That name occurs 11 times in Scripture. There's two in the Old Testament... There's nine in the New Testament, all in Hebrews. I wonder why it's 11 times. I think I would have put 12. No. 11 is the number of inadequacy. Of, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a number of that you would put it as being a complete number. It's the number of inadequacy. In other words, this man was simply a type. He was made like unto the Son of God. He's first king of righteousness... And then he's king of Salem, which is king of peace. And the principle, of course, is pretty plain, isn't it? You cannot have peace without righteousness. And all of those passages you can see there spell that out. James 3, verse 17, Isaiah 48, verse 22, which says, There's no peace to the wicked, saith Yahweh. Uh, Isaiah 32, verse 1, A king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And verses 16 and 17, the effect of righteousness shall be peace. You've got Psalm 72, give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. What will be the consequence of that? Peace. You don't get peace without righteousness. That's the principle of scripture. So that's, brothers and sisters, why this man, Melchizedek, is so important. And his order is the order in which you and I will be priests. We're called... Israel was called a royal priesthood in Exodus chapter 19 verse 6 and the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says that you and I are a royal priesthood. We're being prepared for that role to serve alongside of our Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom. It is superior to the Levitical priesthood as the Apostle makes clear in Hebrews chapter 7. It is without beginning or end. It's not dependent on genealogy or descent. Hebrews 7 verse 3. It is predicated on one quality, one moral quality, righteousness. It is not constituted by law, but by a divine oath given to Christ in Psalm 110 verse 4. It serves continually by the power of an endless life, the Apostle says in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 16. And it restores the right of priesthood to the firstborn. 
and that's where it resided in the beginning. And we're going to have just a bit of a look at that. So here's the history of priesthood. Adam was the first priest. Cain, the firstborn, should have been the priest of his family. But of course he failed miserably. When you come to Melchizedek, you've got him pointing to Christ, Yahweh's firstborn. And the firstborn was superseded, of course, in the wilderness. In Exodus 24 and verse 5, we read this. And Moses sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Yahweh. Well, why didn't he send Aaron and his sons? Well, they hadn't yet been appointed. They weren't appointed until much later. You know, they were purified in the events of the seven days of Leviticus chapter 8 and 9. This was way back when they were just come to Mount Sinai. All right? That's when they were declared to be a kingdom of priests. Who were the priests when these sacrifices were made? Well, it says it was the young men. Yeah, the firstborn young men of Israel. So priesthood resided with the firstborns from the beginning. Well, that was, of course, replaced. The Levites, the family of Aaron in particular, became the priests of Israel from the wilderness wandering to AD 70. In actual fact, to be very accurate, to AD 30. Because that's when our Lord Jesus Christ was immortalised, and that is when he became a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You need two qualities to be a Melchizedek priest. You know what they are? Righteousness is the moral quality and immortality is the physical quality. So until he was made immortal, he could not be a Melchizedek priest. We know that from the testimony in Hebrews chapter 7. We know it from places like Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. You know what it says? God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. So, he's appointed a day to judge the world in righteousness. That'll be through Christ as Melchizedek. Right? And he gave testimony in that he raised him from the dead. You've got to have two qualities. One's moral, one's physical. Right? Righteousness and immortality. Well, you and I will go to the judgment seat pretty shortly, brothers and sisters. And we'll be declared blameless and faultless because we will have asked our God for the forgiveness of our sins. We will have set our course towards the kingdom. And we'll go there with a righteousness that has been granted to us. And hopefully a manifested righteousness in the development of our character. We got that moral quality. Guess what? You're going to get the next one. You're going to get the physical quality. Immortality. That's when you become a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So this is a very, very important subject for us. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, in his sacrifice, his resurrection, his immortalisation, his ascension to heaven, becomes this high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the firstborn will be restored to priesthood. And there's one verse I'd like to show you in Hebrews while we're here. Hebrews chapter 12. In the context of this particular subject, You see the apostles contrasting what the Hebrews wanted to do. They wanted to go back to law. and So he goes back and he looks at Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. And then he contrasts that with Mount Zion in verse 22 of Hebrews 12. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of messengers, to the general assembly and ecclesia of firstborns. Now, You'll notice that's not quite what the King James says. You can cross out the the word the. There's no article in the Greek. And you can add an S to the word firstborn because in the Greek it's in plural. So that's how it should read. He says, to the general assembly and ecclesia of firstborns, which are written in heaven, which means your name is in the book of life. And to God the judge of all, and to the spirits or the characters of righteous men made perfect. Right, the apostles been talking about people who will be in the kingdom in chapter 11. The great cloud of witnesses. Right, he's saying they're going to be in the kingdom. And so can you, if you've got these two qualities. 
You can be there, but you've got to have the righteousness before you can get the immortality. That's the order of Melchizedek. So with that, brothers and sisters, we can go back and have a look at what David does in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And it's a marvellous thing that he does. And I think you've already seen in our first study the mind of David on these matters. And that's why God calls David a man after his own heart. And there are a couple of testimonies about that. There's First Samuel chapter 13, 14 on the screen behind me. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. Yahweh hath sought him, says Samuel to Saul, a man after his own heart. And the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, when he's addressing a community, he says, And when he had removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfil all my will. Now, this is not so much about character. It's not so much about character. It's actually about comprehension. It's about understanding. It's about perception. And David was the most perceptive man of the Old Testament when it came to the divine mind and the divine plan and purpose. So let's just explore. What does this phrase, after mine own heart, mean? Well, Brother Carter once wrote that the heart is the deeper part of the mind where character is formed. You know, it's the real you. It's where God is working to create a likeness to himself in you. Uneducated and undirected, the human heart is naturally given to deception and evil. We know from those testimonies, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, that the heart of man is wicked above all things. Mark 7, 21 to 23, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and then you get the list. Its ultimate character and inclination depends on the external influence of divine instruction. And Brother Sargent wrote, in the teaching of the Master, David was the most God-conscious man of the Old Testament. That's saying something, isn't it? The most God-conscious man of the Old Testament. He had a comprehension of God's mind second to none. It was a perception of what God intended in his plan and purpose with the Gentiles that brought him to bring the ark to Zion and to put it in a tent of his own making. So this is what it's meant by God finding a man after his own heart. And we want to see how early that began in the life of David. I want you to come to Psalm 132. Psalm 132 was written, you will see from the, the insertion by the translators... At the heading of this psalm, which they get right, it says, David's prayer at the removing of the ark. They're quite right in that. He wrote this psalm at the time that we've just been reading of in 2 Samuel 6, when he took the ark from kirjath jearim to Jerusalem, bypassing the tabernacle of Moses. Okay? In verses 1 to 5, David vows to give the ark rest. In verse 6, he tells us he comprehended the rightful place for the ark while he was in Bethlehem as a teenage shepherd. So let's have a look at these verses. Verse 1, Yahweh remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto Yahweh and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob, Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for Yahweh and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. So when did he make up his mind that he was going to bring the ark to Zion? Well, he tells us in verse 6. Lo, we heard of it at Ephratah. Now, of course, Ephratah is near Bethlehem, isn't it? We heard of it at Ephratah. So this is when he was in Bethlehem. And then he says, we found it in the fields of the wood. It's just very interesting because you see, while David was on the run from Saul in the fields of the wood, he decided the ark's destiny because he had thought about this on the hillsides in Bethlehem. And where did he find it? 
He found it in a place called Kerjath Jerem, which just happens to mean the city of forests, the city of the woods. That's where he found it and brought it to Jerusalem. So he made up his mind to do that as a teenager and he performed it when he was 38 years of age. That's when the ark came to Zion. Perhaps David's Melchizedek-related vow that he makes here in Psalm 132, verse 2, he says, How he swore unto Yahweh and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. That vow, we believe, was taken while he was still in his teenage years. Perhaps that vow of David elicited Yahweh's vow of Psalm 110, verse 4. And, of course, Psalm 110 is a psalm of David in which Yahweh vows to his son, Yahweh said unto my Lord. All right? You know the words pretty well. Yahweh said unto my Lord, says David. He's talking about Christ. I will make you a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he swore that vow to Christ through David in Psalm 110. And I think maybe David's vow to bring the ark to Zion elicited that vow from Yahweh because of David's comprehension of the divine plan to include both Jews and Gentiles in his purpose. Now, this is why David was so determined to rule from Jerusalem. Come back to 2 Samuel chapter 5. He's been king in Hebron for seven years. There has been conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. We read in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 5, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David and to Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And Yahweh said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before Yahweh, and they anointed David king over Israel. Okay, so what's the very first thing he does? Well, we're told that he reigned 30 years. Uh, he was 30 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 40 years. Verse 5, we're told he reigned in Hebron for seven years and in Jerusalem for the balance of 33 years over all Israel. So that's just telling us the detail. Look at verse 6. What's the first thing he does? The very first thing he does. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, and of course they took it. It had been in the hands of the Jebusites for 500 years. And it's the first thing he does when he becomes the king of all Israel. Why would he do that? Because he's made a vow. And the vow was that he's going to put the ark where it rightfully belongs. It belongs in Jerusalem. So he takes Jebus from the hands of the Jebusites. Because he's going to put the ark there. That's why he was determined to rule from Jerusalem. Hebron, of course, mentioned in verse 3, means fellowship. And they made a league with him. There was a fellowship between the men of Israel they made a covenant before Yahweh in the presence of Yahweh and they declared David their king they anointed him and of course that word anointed is Meshach and it's the root the root of that word is Mashiach or no it is the root of Mashiach which is Messiah okay so here is David who's going to become a type of our Lord Jesus Christ so in Jerusalem he reigned 34 uh, For 33 years over all Israel. He was 38. 38 when he took the capital. In verse 6, the king and his men went to Jerusalem, one of his first priorities. And he removed the Jebusites that had been there for half a millennium. Jebus, of course, means trodden down. It's a threshing place. And it's picked up in Luke 21, verse 24, when we read, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And Solomon's temple was built on a threshing floor, the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. What a beautiful harmony there is in all of that. 
That brings us then to consideration of chapter 6 of 2 Samuel. We've got mention here in verse 2 of Baalai, or Baal, of Judah, lords of Judah, called Baalai, mistress, that's what the word means, Baalai, it's got the feminine there, in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 6. It's also called kerjath Jerem. This is the place, kerjath Jerem, the city of the forests. And we read in that verse that it's, it was the place where the ark was found, and this ark, of course, had in it, had with it, the Shekinah glory. There was Yahweh of armies that dwelt between the cherubims. And it underlines the importance to David of the ark. He was not going to be ruling without that ark being a principal part of his kingdom. But they make a mistake, don't they? In verse 3 of 2 Samuel 6, they set the, car, the, the ark upon a car. Oh, it's a new car. But that's exactly what the Philistines did. The Philistines, when they sent it back to the land, remember? After it had been torturous for them for months. They made a new car. And unfortunately, that's exactly what David does. And it doesn't work, does it? It does not work. Abinadab, the man mentioned in verse 3. They took it out of the house of Abinadab. His name means, my father is willing. And then, it was, and when it says in the King James that was in Gibeah, uh, Brother Duane's translation, the RSV, said, in the hill. And that's how it should be rendered here. So this is about kerjath Jerem. If you go there, kerjath Jerem is built on a hill. Right? There it was. So here was the house of Abinadab on the hill. And that's where it had been for 20 years. And we know the story of Uzzah. It says at the end of verse 3 of 2 Samuel 6 that Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new car. Uzzah's name means strength. Ahio means brotherly. He was the driver or the guide of the car and Uzzah was walking beside this new car. In verse 4, they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah or in the hill as it should read accompanying the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before Yahweh in all manner of instruments so there was great rejoicing. That word played there by the way, sakak, means to laugh. There was a lot of joy. It's also used to playing instruments. And there are five instruments mentioned here. Five the number of grace. But it didn't turn out that way, did it? It didn't turn out that way because they weren't doing it according to the requirement in connection with the ark. And in verse 6, at Nacon's threshing floor, his name means prepared, but they were not prepared. At Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. His motive was pure, wasn't it? His motive was perfectly pure. But his desire to save the ark unwittingly was disrespectful to it and to the Shekinah presence that dwelt between the cherubim. You know, it had been in his father's house for 20 years. And probably familiarity had desensitised him to its sanctity. It's like that, isn't it? You know, it's been there for 20 years. It's part of your life tends to desensitise you. And so he makes a mistake. He puts forth his hand. Because the oxen stumbled. Now if the Carthites had been carrying the ark as prescribed by the law, the disaster would have been averted. But you see, David was operating. He, he was operating essentially outside the law. But he needed to get this right. Verse 7 tells us that the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God. You know, even if the Kohathites had been walking beside the car and one of the Kohathites had put out his hand, he too would have died. Not even they were allowed to touch the ark. We know that from Numbers chapter 4, verses 15 and 19 to 20. Even the Kohathites, though they carried it on the post, the poles on their shoulders, were not allowed to reach out and touch the box itself. They would have died too. There had to be respect for the ark, which spoke of the presence of God in their midst. Now look at verse 8. David was displeased because Yahweh had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he calls the, the place Perez Uzzah. 
This word displeased, kara, means to be hot or angry. He, he was very angry at what had happened. This word breach, peretz, this is what they called the name, peretz Uzza. Breach or bursting forth a breach. And so this was a place of great disappointment uh, to David. And verse 9 says that he was afraid. He was afraid of Yahweh that day and said, How shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? Now think about this for a while, brothers and sisters. You have made a decision to take the ark and to put it in a tent of your own erection, your own making. Not in the tabernacle of Moses. Where if you'd ask most of the people in Israel at that time, where should it be? That's where they would say it should be. In the most holy place. You believe you're right. You believe you understand what God intends through the Melchizedek priesthood. But you get this disaster. And you're on your back foot. What would you do? Would you give up and say, well, no, let's just take it up to Gibeon, put it in the tabernacle of Moses? Or would you do what David did? And this is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant what David does. He's angry, but when he's calmed down, he makes a decision. And we're told about that decision in verse 10. After he's asked this question, how shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? He made, he answered his own question by the choice of the refuge for the ark in the house of a Kohathite. And that's what we're told in verse 10. So verse 10 says, David would not remove the ark of Yahweh unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. There was absolute precision in his choice. Obed-Edom. What idiotic Israelite would name his son the slave of Edom. You know who Edom represents in the scripture? In the in prophetic scripture? It represents the anti-Semitic power of the Catholic Church. In league with Gog, who as Brother Thomas says, as we said here last year, is for a time the head of the house of Esau because they seek the destruction of Israel. That was the character of Edom. They sought the destruction of Israel. Esau was the first anti-Semite. What idiotic Israelite would name his son a slave of Edom? Or someone did. And because it was the practice of the time to name the children after their fathers, and that happens in America, doesn't it? You name the child, the first son is named after the father's name. And so it goes on. So you've got... You've got Irby Senior, you've got Irby Junior, right? That's how it works. Well, it was very much the, the, the way it was practised in Israel. We know that from Luke one fifty nine. Remember when John the Baptist was born? And because Zacharias couldn't speak, they said, well, we're going to name the boy Zacharias. And he said, no, no, no. And he wrote on the slab saying, his name is John. No, you can't do that. You've got to name it after the father. And that's what happened here. Some idiot named his boy the slave of Edom and because that was the practice it went on. David, when this tragedy of Uzzah occurred and he's got the dead body of a man sitting there and he knows that what he's doing, he believes he's right. He's right. How am I going to prove that I'm right? How am I going to get God involved in this? Go around and find. I want a, I want a house of the Kohathite Right, I want a house of a Kohathite. I'll prove that to you in a second. And I want someone who's connected to the Gentiles by name. So they found a man called Obed-Edom, who was called here a Gittite. Did you see that in verse 10? He was a Gittite. Now, this doesn't refer to Gath, the city of Goliath. This refers to gath Rimmon. It was also a Philistine city, by the way, that Dan was supposed to take. It refers to gath Rimmon, a town given to the Kohathites in the tribe of Dan. And you can jot these references down. I'm not going to go through them with you in great detail. But Joshua chapter 19, verse 40, and verse 45, Joshua 21, verse 20, and verses 23 to 24, will tell you that gath Rimmon was a town 
that was ultimately given to the Kohathites in the territory of the tribe of Dan. That's all you need to know. So you see, he chose, he chose the house of a Kohathite who had a very, very unusual name. Obed-Edom, the slave of Edom. Really? Yeah, why? Well, it was brilliance on the part of David. Because he just went home and he waited. You see, the reason he's bringing the ark to Zion is that Gentiles might worship Yahweh without the restrictions of the law of Moses. That's why he's doing it. So he wants to know what God thinks about this. I've got to get it right. I've got to get the Kohathites to carry it. I know that now. I've got to get that right. But I want to know about this aspect of the Gentiles. So I'll choose a man whose name is the slave of Edom. Now some of you will have good memories. There's a reference to the tabernacle of David, which we'll deal with later on in our study in Amos chapter 9 verse 11. You know what it says? That all the remnant of Edom might be involved. All the remnant of Edom. We'll come to that in due time. That's a clear reference back here to what David does. He chooses a Gentile name of a Kohathite. And we know what happens, don't we? Verse 11 of 2 Samuel 6 says this, And the ark of Yahweh continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and all his household, now, we don't have any conclusive evidence of what the blessing was. But when you go to 1 Chronicles 26, this is 4 and 5, it's pretty plain that it has to do with his family. Something happened within his family. Now, we don't know what the problems of that family were. But what we do know is that there were blessings in the family that were evident to everyone. And whether that was the production of children from women who couldn't have babies, we don't know. But the message got around and finally comes to David and someone comes to him and says, Yahweh has blessed. Look at verse 12 of 2 Samuel 6. It was told King David saying, Yahweh hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. So within three months he got a message from God. And he knew it was from God. That blessing was no accident. So he was waiting for this expression of God's mind. For he had deliberately placed the ark in the house of this chosen Kohathite with a Gentile name. And he comes now with, with gladness, it says, joy and mirth. And Rotherham says rejoicing. And as we said, verse 13 is, is David's acknowledgement. That this really is, it really pertains to the future. The establishment of a Melchizedek king priesthood pertains to the future. He understood that, but he's doing it because he wants to involve Gentiles in the worship of Yahweh without the restrictions of the law. It says, when they had gone, that they that bear the ark in verse 13 had gone six paces, they stopped because of David's comprehension of Genesis 14 and Genesis 22. That was now joined by his appreciation, as we said, of Genesis chapter 1 and the prophecy of the six days using the principle of 2 Peter 3 verse 8 that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. David had an understanding of that and he saw that this belonged to the seventh day of rest, the time of the kingdom age when Christ would be a, a, a king priest after the order of Melchizedek could only be fully realised in the kingdom of God. He sacrificed oxen and fatlings, suggests, of course, primarily burnt offerings of Leviticus chapter 1, which spoke of dedication, as we said yesterday, mentally, morally, and physically. And he operates as a king priest in verse 14. And David danced before Yahweh with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. And we know, of course, what that represents. A linen ephod is the priestly garment, and it speaks of righteousness. Revelation 19 and verse 8. And it was worth shouting in verse 15. Now that word shouting is very interesting. <clears throat> it, it means exactly that. Rotherham translates it with triumphant shoutings. And let me just remind you, 
so that we can deal with this later on perhaps. In our next study, God willing, we're going to meet a man called Ornan the Jebusite who has another name in 2 Samuel chapter 24. His name in 2 Samuel 24 is Arona. And it just happens to mean joyful shoutings of Yahweh. That's what Arona means, the joyful shoutings of Yahweh. And we get a hint, we get a hint here that that's where we're going to end up. The sound of the trumpet is referred to here. The trumpet referred to in verse 15, of course, is the shofar trumpet, the ram's horn, which was blown for praise, as we read in Psalm 150 and verse 3. And then we have a hiccup. Don't we? We've got a hiccup in verse 16. We read, and as the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw the king David leaping and dancing before Yahweh and she despised him in her heart. Now we're going to see the part she plays in this type. And it is a type. She plays the part of Judaizers. She's the type of Judaism. And Saul, her father, was the classic Judaizer. If I had another, another half an hour, I could demonstrate that to you. He was the classic Judaizer. And his daughter was very much like him. She looked. She leaned out, the word being. She leans out the windows. Oh, really? And she despised him in her heart. Disesteemed him, as the word means in the Hebrew. Held him in contempt or disdain. And we'll see what that means in, in a moment. We move on to verse 17. And they brought in the ark of Yahweh and set it in his place, in the midst of the tent, the O hell, that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before Yahweh. So dedication and fellowship were the keys to the placement of this ark in his own tent. And we come down to verse 18. As soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts. And we saw what that kind of blessing would be. It's about the truth working in their life. He's talking about the truth removing from them their iniquities. And this wasn't just the Jews. It was the Gentiles as well. Because you read in verse 19 that he dealt among all the people this includes the Philistines that were in the land. It includes the Hittites like Uriah. There were Gentiles there. He dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel. And then we've got another very interesting thing. As well to the women as men. Now think about that for a while. Do you know how many times the law of Moses offers opportunities to women? To participate. Can you think of any? I can think of one. It's Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6 is about the Nazarite law. And a woman could equally take a Nazarite vow with a man. So it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. You could equally take a Nazarite vow. But that's the only one I can think of. So what's David doing here? Well, he's including women. The law didn't do that. He's operating outside the law of Moses. He treats women on this occasion equally. And what's he going to do? He's going to hand out bread and wine. Like Melchizedek did. Get a bit of a feel for his mind. As he looked down the corridor and he saw the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom he was a forerunner and a type. He knew what he was doing, brothers and sisters. This is why he was a man after God's own heart. And it says to everyone in verse 19. That phrase is picked up, isn't it? In places like Isaiah 55 verse 1. Ho ye that thirst, come ye to the spring. Right? Everyone. It's picked up in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female. They're all related to the, to the promises made to Abraham and therefore to eternal life. There's equality in that respect. Their relationship to eternal life. So that is what David's on about here. He's including men and women. And to everyone, to Jew and Gentile, that wasn't done under the law of Moses. And a cake of bread, it says in verse 19. 
Now, Ramahain translates it, a loaf of bread. So there's a loaf of bread given to everyone. And it goes on to say in that verse, verse 19, and a good piece of flesh. Now you'll notice that the words of flesh are in italics, which is why you can see I've crossed them out. They're not there in the text. When it says a good piece, the, the Hebrew word is eshpah. It means a measured portion. And the companion Bible says it should actually read a measure of wine. So what have we got? We've got a loaf of bread and a measure of wine, which is what you're going to get tomorrow morning, God willing, in memorial meeting. And it says at the end of verse 19, a flagon of wine, the Hebrew word, a shisha, means a raisin cake. That's what Rotherham translates it as. And the companion Bible says a cake of raisins. So the bread and the wine come first. Then you've got the cake of raisins. So all the people, it says, departed every one to his house. This statement, of course, seems quite superfluous, doesn't it? Why, why do you want to say that? Where are you going to go? When the weekend's over. Well, you're going to go to your house, aren't you? Who, want, who cares? Why does the scripture say that? You see, it indicates the unity of the nation with both Jew and Gentile having received a Melchizedek blessing. That's why. There was no distinction between the Israelite and the Gentile. And the tens of thousands of Philistines who were there, most of them were uncircumcised. And they were all regarded as being of the one nation. And they all went to their homes in peace with a Melchizedek blessing. David understood what Genesis 14 was all about. He understood that when Melchizedek brought out bread and wine to a Jewish and Gentile army and shared fellowship with them, that that's exactly what Christ would do. So brothers and sisters, we have the mind of David pointing to the future, to the great things that were to come. And then we've got Michael. Look at verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. So she took the initiative. You know, back in verse 16, we said she symbolises the Mosaic order. And law had been superseded. There'd been a change of the priesthood, remember? What do you do if you change the priesthood? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. What do you do when you change the priesthood? You change the law. See, that's what had happened here. David had changed the nature of the priesthood. Where were the priests of Aaron? They were up with the tabernacle. All right. He's in Jerusalem. He's at his own tent. He's his own priest. After the order of Melchizedek. Right? You change the priesthood, you change the law. So verse 20, he returns to bless his household just as the beloved Christ came to do. John 1 verse 11. And Michael came out, she took the initiative. She wasn't prepared to sit back in her lounge chair and wait for David to come into the room. She went out to challenge him. It was an open challenge to David's approach. And she uses this language of disrespect, scornful contempt it is really, for her own husband. Because they had a difference of belief. A difference of comprehension. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. The word means slaves. As one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. She's not saying he was naked. She was simply saying, you took off those glorious, royal, kingly robes to put on this shabby-looking linen ephod. Really? Is that how kings operate? So you see, she'd been downgraded. In her eyes, this was downgrading the, the royal house. Bringing it down to the level of the common people. Really, can't do that. Yeah, that's pride, isn't it? Human pride, which is what Judaism is really all about. This scornful contempt for her husband. Uncovered himself. The word galah means to uncover yourself. Rotherham says disrobed himself. So it was pride that animated Michael. 
she objected to David removing his royal robes to wear a priestly ephod. In the eyes of the handmaids, she said, thus diminishing Michael, who was a queen, in the eyes of her inferiors, a very, very common Judaistic spirit. She talks about vain fellows, these empty people, as one of the low people. Shamelessly uncovereth himself. Two words there, galah, galah, always intensive in the Hebrew. In 2 Samuel 6 and verse 21, we read, And David said unto Michael, It was before Yahweh which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of Yahweh, over Israel. Therefore will I play or dance before Yahweh. So he explains his motivation. He explains that her father Saul, who was the classic Judaizer, had been removed from the throne. And that his approach, his approach, was approved by God, as we're going to see. And he was made ruler over the people of Yahweh over Israel. That's the key issue, isn't it? It was not about David. It was about Yahweh's people, including the converted Gentiles, whom Michael also despised in verse 20. This word play, sakak, laugh, Rotherham translates it dance. The word vile that we see there in verse 22, I will be more vile than thus, means to be slight or swift, to be trifling. Not vile in the, in the evil sense of that word. He's talking about being low in his own estimation. And he confirms that his choice to humble himself was right. Rotherham translates it lightly esteemed. I'm going to be lightly esteemed because I'm going to be down amongst the common people as their representative. I'll be base in mine own sight. I'll become lowly, as Brother Ham says. Can you think of another man that did this? I think I can think of one. His name was Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he was hung on a cross naked. What would the Judaizers say about that? All right. Get a picture. See where David's mind is, brothers and sisters. Of them, he says, I shall be had in honour. And he included all the stratas in Israel, men and women, Jew and Gentile. So David's humility clearly foreshadowed that of Christ, who was nailed to the cross, disrobed in the process of a sacrifice made on behalf of all mankind. And that's why David was doing this. It's on behalf of the Gentiles as well as the Jews that were in his land. And look how this chapter ends in verse 23. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. I wonder what that means. There was no contact between David and Michael from here on. No contact. She represents the Mosaic order in the type. And like the law of Moses, she was barren and could not give life. In the same way as we are told in Galatians chapter 2, 21, 3, 21 and Romans 3, 20. The law could not give life. Not even the Son of God could attain to eternal life through keeping the law because it cursed him in the manner of his death. So, we have Michael representing the law of Moses in this type. It could not produce life. Michael's marriage to David was designed by Saul to undermine and destroy David. Saul was the consummate Judaizer and his daughter followed his approach. To her, the dignity of royalty in the sight of the people was paramount. That's exactly what the Judaizers were like in Matthew 23.